Oh. So are we all getting excited for spring? Yes. Everybody's getting impatient. This week it is... Live. Welcome to Waters Garden Center. My name's Michelle, and today's class is the spring to-do list. Um, so we'll kind of go through everything that we should be doing now um, and um, answer any questions that you might have. Um, I also have some products up here that I will we'll love to share with you. I have some new trees um, that we're introducing this year, so I'm excited about that. Um, so um, Welcome to the class. Uh, the first thing I want to kind of get out there because next week is really exciting for us. It's the 60th anniversary of Waters Garden Center. Um, so next week, starting on Friday, um, the, the class is moving to Friday like we kind of discussed earlier. But for those online, um, we'll, we will start having our Friday classes. And then uh, on Saturday, we have all our vendors coming, which is going to be really exciting. It's, it's been three years since we've had all our vendors show up. Um, so we're really, really excited about that. Um, so I've got folks from Monrovia, Armstrong, um, Savano's down in Tucson. Uh, so we're really, really excited about that. Um, yes, bonus. Does that make sense? Okay. So the first thing on the spring to-do list is it, it's time to prune. So all of those folks that have been waiting to prune, now's the time to do it. Uh, so roses, um, autumn sages, Russian sage, all of that stuff, grasses, ornamental grasses, now's the time to do it. Um, I just brought a rose up just kind of looking um, Obviously, this is completely dormant. We bring them in this way because uh, they're easier to plant. But this is kind of what you're looking for when you're pruning a rose. You want all of the branches kind of going outward. You don't want a lot of in inside branching. Um, so that's what you're pruning off this time of year. Um, going down, it, it's more of what you want your rose to look like. Um, most of us like that four foot rose that's full of color so you don't have to burn it all the way down you can leave it to wherever you've got greenery um, a lot of times the roses don't go completely dormant here um, so it, it's all going to depend on your location and what you have going on how far down you're going to prune a rose um, so i do have these dormant roses um, there's probably 50 down there right now. We started out with 100. Um, the end of April, if you are a rose person, is the best time to show up. Uh, we have a truckload of 800 to 1,000 roses that show up that last week in April, and it's exciting. Um, the place is just full of color. They're all in bloom. Um, so it's really, really pretty around here that time of year. Um, so something to look forward to towards the end of April. 
Um, roses do extremely well here. Um, once a week watering, once they're established is all they need. Um, sometimes twice a week if you have very well-drained soil. If you're in heavy clay, probably once a week, probably get you by. Always check. If, if you're not sure what your watering situation is, put your finger in the ground. If it's moist, don't water. If it's uh, dry, go ahead and water it. And water very thoroughly when you water um, when you're pruning, uh, there are certain plants that you do not want to prune. Um, forsythias and lilacs are two of them that you don't want to prune right now um, because they are spring bloomers. If you prune them now, you will not give flowers on that, any growth that you cut off. Um, so obviously this one was pruned. That's why this didn't uh, flower out. Um, but the bottom part will. So that, that's kind of how that works. Um, once it's done blooming, that's when you go through and prune, shape up, um, and do your shaping and such. Uh, fruit trees as well. Uh, it's a good time to prune your tr fruit trees. Um, don't over prune. Um, it's something that tends to happen. Never take more than a third off of whatever plant you're pruning, except for grasses. I mean, those you're going to cut back all the way almost to the ground. Um, I usually leave about a foot stump, depending on what type of grass it is that you're cutting. Um, but pruning uh, fruit trees will increase your production eventually. Um, so it is time to do that. Um, what else do we need to prune? Autumn sages, now's the time to do it. And I just kind of brought this guy up just to show you. Um, a lot of times the autumn sage uh, gets really, really woody. Um, this is fairly young plant. Um, and so he's not completely woody, but if you have a really heavy branch in here, just cut it out. It'll come up from the bottom um, and then they'll, they'll be perfect. Um, I usually take them down to about eight inches, 12 inches. It kind of depends on how big your plant is to begin with. Um, and then you'll get all this new growth um, that's coming up here. Let's see, lavender. Um, sometimes lavender kind of takes a winter hit, um, and when we bring stuff in early, it doesn't look spectacular, spectacular like we usually like to see them, um, but this is what lavender looks like in your yard right now. Um, you know, it'll have a little bit of yellow where it's kind of died back, but if you look inside here, you've got all this new growth that's popping out, and that's what we're looking forward to. Um, so if this was my plant at home, I'd almost just mound it up, and, and it'd be ready to go for spring, um, and now's a good time to do that. This is what we like our lavenders to look like when we bring them in. Um, this is a Spanish lavender, and then this is an English lavender. That's why there's a difference in them. Um, so there's four different types of lavenders that we carry. Um, we carry the English lavender, which is this one. Um, Spanish lavender, we get French lavender. Um, so we, uh, what was the other? There's three lavenders, sorry. Uh, so the French, English, and, and Spanish. Sounds like a voice class or English or language class. Um, okay. Any questions on pruning while I'm here? Yes. Okay. Roses, you said take back to green. Why the whole, you know, bushes, close to let it out, are you weak though? Okay. So how far back do I take? Okay, her question was, is her rose is all full, fully leafed out and all budded? I would say you don't have to do anything. Yay for you. Um, it, if it's already budded out and you don't have any dieback, basically pruning is a process of getting ready, get a, getting ready, getting rid of dead stuff. Um, or if you are from back east or Colorado where our temperatures get lower, they do die back to the ground. So that's why we, we're so used to cutting them back so drastically. They don't do that here. So we don't have to worry about cutting them all the way back unless you want a small, short 
grows. Um, so you're good to go. No work needed. Any other pruning class questions? Possibly. <laughs> uh, her, her lavender is doesn't have any green leaves. So what I would do um, is, is trim it back little by little and see if you have any green stems in there. Um, and, and you will see that if you um, get down. Um, so there should be green inside there. Um, so just do a little at a time and then just cut it back. If you get all the way to the base and there's no, I think so. Um, so winter watering is very, very important with, with living here. Um, winter is our driest time of the year um, or one of them. Um, so make sure that you're watering in the winter time. You don't have to water often. It's just every two weeks, twice a month. Um, just drag a hose out, water it, because I know most of our systems are turned off. Um, just drag a hose out and give it a bucket of water. Um, just make sure it gets down to the roots. Obviously, if you're watering a tree, you're going to do more water than you are with something like this, um, because that water only has to go eight inches, whereas a tree is going 18. Okay, any more pruning questions? Okay. Um, now is also a great time to get your uh, pre-emergent down. Um, if you did not get it yesterday, get it today before the rain starts because it needs to be watered in. Um, so what the pre-emergent does is it um, creates a barrier for all those weed seeds that are laying dormant in the ground. Some of them have already started sprouting already. Um, the pre-emergent will not take care of the ones that are already up. Um, it will take care of any seeds that are still laying dormant in there that haven't come, popped up. Um, and you want to do it pretty soon because our temperatures are beginning to rise. We're seeing more days in the 60s, um, and that's when germination starts to come up. Um, so get it down as soon as you can. If you can catch it by the rainstorm, that's great. Um, if not, just water it in really good because you want that bar uh, barrier to to, to be created. If you do not water it in, it will not do any good. pre -emerge. Ornamental. So the, the good thing with this is there is quite a, you can use this in your gardens er, or your garden areas. You wouldn't want to use it in your vegetable garden or in a grassy lawn area if you're going to plan on reseeding, you wouldn't want to use this because it would keep that grassy from germinating. Um, but in your flower beds, you can put it in there. Um, in your rocky areas to keep those dandelions and the whorehound and all of those things that pop up uh, in your rock area, this is what you're going to put down. Um, it is a granular product. This will do about 2,000 square feet. Um, and like I said, you want to water it in when you put it down. It can go straight on the rock, and you just water your rock um, to keep all those weeds from coming up. Okay. Um, her question was, is it harmful for animals? So what I tell people is once it's dry, it's not. So once you wet it down, don't let your animals out until it's dry. Um, if it's on the rock, it's going to wash down into the soil where we want it, and they can go out once it's dried out. Okay. Any other questions on pre-emergent? Okay. Um, we are starting to see bugs already, um, which is, it's like, we have cold nights. It was 16 degrees two weeks ago. Um, so please start watching for bugs. Um, aphids are starting to show up. I've had three or four little branches that have the bugs um, on them. It's like, ah. A uh, couple of roses have ro uh, aphids on them. Um, so now's the time to do that. Um, the other thing that we're going to put on now, I thought I put plant protector on. 
is plant protector. So this will take care of your aphids. Um, so this is a pyrethrin and uh, neem oil mix. Uh, so you spray it on. The pyrethrin is a residue that'll stay on the roses. Um, so when they start eating, they die. Um, the neem oil in it coats those the bugs so they suffocate. Um, so it, it's kind of a double duty. It, it keeps new ones from getting on there and then, or it kills the new ones that, that are on there and, and it suffocates the ones that are already there. Um, great product. Um, once it heats up, you have to be very careful with this because it is an oil-based product. If you put oil-based products on your plants and shrubs in the heat of the summer, you will fry them. It, it's like baby oil back in the 60s and 70s that we used to love. Um, so you don't want that to happen. Uh, so make sure that you do it early in the morning or late in the evening so it has time to absorb in before the heat of the day. Um, plant protector is another thing that we wanna put on right now. Um, any of you that have pine trees, uh, the, the pine scale is out. Um, Several branches have come in as well with those on it. What you are looking for is actually the branch itself. And we're looking at the needles, okay? So the scale is gonna be on the needle itself, okay? And, and you'll see little dots and you'll actually be able to see it um, and that's the scale on there. And scale is a hard bodied shell insect. Um, so he gets on there before the shell uh, comes up and then he kind of shells over to protect himself, but he just sucks the life out of, the, out of your trees. Most of your pinion pines will get this. Um, it do, we don't see it too much on the pine, the regular ponderosa pines that are around here, Austrian pines, Oregon green pines. Uh, mostly it's on the pinion pines that we see. Um, so be careful with that. Uh, the plant protector also works really well on pine bark beetle. So it is a systemic that we put into the ground. And it's one of the few things that actually go around the trunk of the tree. Um, it goes up the cambium layer of the tree and it is systemic. So it, it works as they, they are boring into the tree. Um, so it goes up about a foot a day. Um, so depending on how tall your tree, it's gonna take that many days to get up there. Um, it is applied one ounce per inch of um, circumference. So you'll measure your tree and figure it out. Um, if you wanna do a diameter, there's also instructions for that as well. Um, but to apply that, you want the soil moist about four feet from the tr base of the tree. Um, you want it wet because if you put it on when it's dry, your soil's gonna suck that insect side out um, and it won't go up where we want it to go. So make sure it's nice and moist so it has plenty of room to go straight up the tree and not go into the soil that's around it. Okay, questions? Okay, yes. Oh no, the, the systemic is not used on vegetables, um, just on trees. Um, you can use it on fruit trees um, and you will apply it after the bloom season. Um, it will protect from borers and such. Um, and, and people always look at me, why do I wanna put systemic on a, a fruit tree? Well, the way the molecules work is by the time it gets up to the fruit, it, it's, it will not, enter the fruiting stage. Um, so you wanna get it on early so it doesn't do that, or so it, it's safe that way. Um, don't put it on any flowering things either because it is imacloprid, um, which does kill the bees. Um, so just be careful with it. Okay, next. Feeding, food. Um, Now's the time to feed as well. So we feed three times a year for our 
deciduous, uh, deciduous plants and trees. Um, so anything that loses its leaves is deciduous. Um, evergreens get a fourth application, which is usually New Year's. So we always tell you to remember the holidays because it's easy that way. Um, so Easter, Fourth of July, Halloween, and New Year's. Um, if you are an accounting people person, think of quarterly. Um, so March uh, or April, um, July, October, and, and December. Um, so. Um, just kind of think about it that way. Um, why do we feed so often here? Our soil is nothing. Um, there is no nutrients whatsoever in it, except for some iron, some calcium. But with our high pH, there's not enough. The, the, the plants just can't intake it. So we really want to be careful with that. Um, this fertilizer here actually has sulfur in it. So it allows the plants to intake the nutrients better. Um, if you are using the fruit and vegetable, if you have more fruits and vegetables, I use this often, but I also add sulfur to my plants too, um, because there's no sulfur in this. Um, so both of these will do anything on, that you have. Um, you don't have to specifically get this or this, or if you have a half and half mixture, you can combine them. There is a price difference if you uh, buy more, um, so there's more discount if you buy more. Um, but great products, we live by them. So um, they're specially formulated for this region. So uh, this is what Ken has come up with that, that worked really well, okay. Questions? Yes, you should. Yeah. Well, it's any time in March. Yeah, Easter kind of flips on us as far as the dates go. Um, so we want to do it that way. And we get a lot of moisture usually in March. So it's a good time to get it down. Um, you can uh, put this down before the storm comes to and you won't have to water it in. And, and when we're talking about food, that means all of your plants. So your pines, your shrubs, your perennials, uh, your vegetable gardens, natives, um, they need food too. Um, yeah, you see them living elsewhere, um, but some of them need help. I, I see manzanitas dying all over the place because they're, they're not We've been so dry, they're dying because of that. Um, so the food helps bring down that stress. Speaking of moisture. <laughs> um, top dressing. Uh, we want to top dress with a nice layer of the composted mulch, um, which gives the plants a, a nice, easy base um, that keeps it moist. It also keeps it from drying out so much when, when our heat does come on. And it also feeds your plants a little bit at a time um, because that mulch will break down and, and put organic matter into your plants. Um, we also use that mulch when we're planting. So it's not your bark chips. You can use the, the cedar chips if you choose, um, or you could use the regular composted mulch, um, whichever one kind of look that you prefer, uh, it, it's good to have it on there. Okay. I lost my sheet. I'm saying that again. You can put it on now, um, just get it on before, before the heat comes on, uh, because what happens if you just leave dry soil, it tends to crack. And then you get such a hard layer on top, sometimes it's hard for the water to soak into it. Um, so we, if you keep that evenly moist, we don't get that cracking in, and the moisture will actually go down into it easier. Okay. Let's see, all-purpose plant food. Um, we did that, sorry. Um, amending gardens. Um, so it's just about time for vegetables. Um, 
Now's the time to get your cool season crops. The great thing about living up here in Prescott, we have three um, garden seasons. So now's the time to do your cool season plants, your spinach, your beets, your onions, your peas, all of that stuff that like the cool weather. Um, yes, they can take a frost. Um, when you first get them home, these plants, a lot of them just came out of the greenhouse. Um, so we do need to get them used to being out in the cold. Um, so um, cover them up for a couple of days, a couple of weeks, and then they'll be fine. Um, once they are used to the area, you don't have to worry about any of that. Um, they actually like the cold um, and it helps them do their thing. Yeah. So seeds, I would wait just a little bit longer because seeds do need 60 uh, degrees to germinate or more. Yes, you can. Um, so for those at home that didn't probably hear that, she asked about seeds. Seeds need 60 degrees to germinate. Um, you can start things indoors, um, absolutely. A bright sunny window, get them going and then put plugs in. You, uh, her question was, how big do you want it to get before you put it inside? So what you're looking for is three leaves. Um, so you want a, a good three leaf um, plant before you take it out. Um, because if you don't, you probably don't have enough roots to get started outside. Okay, so a little bit bigger is better. Um, so it gives them more um, chance to get the sunlight, to get that energy going so they can put down new roots in their new home. Okay. okay. Um, amending gardens. Um, if you are planning on a vegetable garden, now is the time. We've kind of been talking about this for a couple of months, um, trying to get ready for um, the cool season crops. If you're planning on planting tomatoes and things in May, um, you definitely want to get started with this right now. Um, if you have a raised bed, you want to add the, the composted mulch and some newer in there. It gets that nice organic matter working in there. Um, add fertilizer as well, just to get those uh, ingredients going. Uh, calcium is one of your most important things to add. If you are using the fruit and vegetable food, it has calcium in it, um, which works really, really well. I didn't have to add any extra gypsum to my, my uh, vegetable garden last year because I was using the fruit and vegetable. Um, what calcium does in a vegetable garden, if you've ever seen those black spots on the back, on your bottom of your tomatoes, that's blossom end rot. Um, we get blossom end rot with our tomatoes, peppers, squash, um, and, and the squash will start out and then it'll just kind of wrinkle up and that's blossom end rot on a squash. Um, pepper is kind of the same thing as the tomatoes. It just turns black at the bottom. Um, so putting that calcium in it, it allows that flower blossom to drop off and that, that's what causes that. Um, the blossom sticks to that and, and um, it causes that bacteria to grow. Any questions about garden prep? It's a barnyard mix, so it's chicken poop and, and cow and, and that type of thing. It, it's not hot. It's been very, very well aged. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Okay. Um, planting. Now is a good time to get stuff planted. Um, so deciduous trees, um, they're, they're dormant. So now's a great time to get them in. You don't get transplant shock. Um, your spring uh, flower pots and all of those can go in. Your pansies, your stock, uh, snapdragons, calendulas, dianthus, all of that stuff can go in now. It, what happens if it snows? It's okay. They don't mind the snow. Um, they don't mind being cold. 
Um, that's why we get to enjoy them from November through May um, because they like our type of weather here. Um, so um, get them in now. I forgot to do this, so let me start this around. <laughs> Um, this is our sheet. So all the information that you see, um, there is a article that will be attached um, to it. So you'll get this, the nine steps that we went over today um, and it'll be written out for you. So you, you, you have all that information. So let me start this here. And Ken's cards there, if you want one, absolutely take it. Um, what was I saying? Um, Planting uh, fruit trees is a great time to get them in. Evergreens as well, shrubs, all of that stuff can get in, get in now. Um, what I always caution people is if it is under our greenhouses, the reason it's there is because we wanna try to get it used to being in the cold. Um, so if you take something home, kind of get it, you still have to temper it. So it's, it's just like starting your vegetables inside. If you throw those right out in the garden, they're not going to do very well. You've got to get them used to being out in the cold. So we just have to introduce them to our weather patterns. Um, once they're in, they'll be just fine. Um, so that's kind of... Uh, the fruit trees that we grow here, we can do pretty much everything except citrus. Um, citrus is not one of them, the ones that we do, um, but apples, peaches, pears, cherries, um, pomegranates, um, what am I missing? Uh, fig trees grow here as well. Um, we will get fig trees probably mid-April, end of April. Um, when they ship them in, they all have leaves, and I don't like them to go when they get here because they aren't used to being cold yet. Um, so um, all of those things do really, really well. Um, we sell um, some dwarf trees, which true dwarfs are gonna get in that five to six foot size range. Most of our trees are semi-dwarf, but the nice thing about fruit trees is that they are very prunable. Um, like I said before, you never wanna take more than a third off at a time, but if you want to keep your peach tree at a nice eight foot level, do so. Um, just prune it back a little at a time and, and that way you can keep the shape the, the way you want to. Um, speaking of fruit trees, let me show you a couple. Um, this guy I just couldn't resist because he's so pretty. Um, this is a nectarine tree. Um, this is a great tree, even if you're not looking for fruit, um, because he's just pretty. Um, how can you resist all his color? Uh, but getting the fruit as well is awesome. Um, this is the flavor top nectarine. Um, most of your peaches, nectarines, and apricots all bloom this pretty pink color. Um, so all of those three are also self-fertile, so you only need one tree. You don't need a second one to pollinate. Um, so they all should fruit. Um, when you do your fruit trees, make sure that um, that first year, most of our trees are large enough where you should get fruit that first year. So just kind of be careful with that. Don't go overboard because fruit production takes energy from your root systems. And if you have just planted it, you want a good root system to support your beautiful fruit tree. Um, so prune some of it off, keep the ones that are closer to the middle of your trunk um, because your branches will not break that way. If you keep the ones on this side, as they get bigger, you're gonna end up breaking this branch. Um, so we want to keep them kind of inside um, just so our branches don't break. Um, I can't tell you how many people have come in towards end of July. My tree just broke and it just split in half because the branch was so heavy with peaches that it, it just couldn't take it anymore. Um, so just be careful with that. Um, peaches should be pretty much pruned off about six inches. I stepped too close. Um, about six inches 
apart. So if you kind of keep that in mind, your apples and your pears, um, you should have a, a peach or an apple every six inches. Um, cherries don't need to be pruned out. Um, they're fine the way they are. They're not super heavy, so they don't have that problem. Um, any other questions on that? Yes, absolutely. This is a really cool tree as well. Um, this is one of Bailey's uh, trees that we've loved for years. Um, this is a three-in-one tree. Um, so there are three trees grafted to this root. Um, there is a Honeycrisp, a Cortland, and a Sweet 16. Um, these are back east uh, apples. Um, most of them are very familiar back there. Um, the, they're all sweet. Um, apples, so eating apples, um, but a great tree um, that gives you a little bit of uh, options as far as having three different types. Um, but it's fabulous because it has, some of our three-in-ones are just grafted on the trunk, so you just get branches. This one, you actually get a whole tree, um, which is kind of nice. Um, if you are this was in your yard and it had been there for a while. Um, pruning is fairly easy. It's kind of like that. You, you just don't want these branches to rub when it goes in um, with, with the wind um, because it'll cause damage in here. So anything that's going into the middle, you're going to prune out. Okay. Mac. This is one of our cool new trees. Um, this is a parkland pillar, and this is actually a birch tree. Um, so it, it's not going to be your white birch, white barked birch. It will turn lighter as it grows, but it's columnar. This guy is only going to get seven feet wide. Um, so for all of us, about 30 tall. Um, it still gets tall, but that it's that width that a lot of us can't handle. So um, a great little tree, um, bright gold foliage in the fall, um, bright green in the summertime, um, but a great little tree. Um, really excited about this one. This is another one of my favorite trees. Um, this is just a twisty baby honey locust. Um, I love this guy because he's just cool um, with all his quirky um, branching and all. Um, very cool tree. Bright green foliage and it has little yellow flowers in the springtime. Uh, moderate size, it's gonna get about 20 feet tall and about 15 wide. Um, drought tolerant and um, right outside this door there's some that are actually been pruned up so you just have this lollipop top to it this one's kind of cool because they have the branching going from the bottom up uh, so it's just a great specimen he does have thorns and he kind of bites This is a new tree for us here as well. Um, when I was in Colorado, we had these. Um, these this is a ivory silk Japanese lilac tree. Um, very pretty tree. Um, ornamental, uh, so it's only going to get uh, 20 feet tall and about 15 wide. Um, bright white blooms in springtime um, that smell amazing. Uh, fall color is going to be golden yellow. Um, so it's a great tree as well. Um, like I said, it's a, it's a new specimen, very drought tolerant. It is also um, 
heat tolerant, so it should do just fine. Um, kind of has moderate leaves, so it should handle our wind pretty good too. Um, so we're excited about this tree as well. And this is just one of my favorite crab apples. Um, this is the prairie fire crab apple. And I just love his dark bark. Um, just really pretty. And he has purple foliage all summer long. Um, kind of goes orange uh, in the wintertime or fall. I'm sorry. Um, the fruit on him is persistent. When what I mean is persistent, it has small little fruit, about a quarter of an inch or so. Um, and persistent means it's going to hold on to the tree so it doesn't drop. Um, like old-fashioned crab apples used to. Um, so it, it gives them a chance to feed the birds and enjoy all of that. Um, beautiful dark pink blossoms on this guy. Gorgeous, gorgeous tree. Um, he will get about 20 feet tall and about that wide. Um, so was, he's kind of an ornamental sized tree. Looks like you're looking for a small tree. <laughs> Okay. When I was talking earlier about um, peonies, um, most of mine at home, I just have little buds that are just kind of popping up. Um, if anybody has this type of foliage that's popped up right now, I would definitely cover it for the next couple of nights because we are going to get cold. Um, the snow shouldn't bother. It snows a nice insulator, but I don't think we're going to get that much anyway. At least it didn't look like it. Um, but we have peonies now. It's a great time to get them in. Like I said, most of the ones down there are just just popping up. So uh, if you get them in now, you'll enjoy the blooms this uh, May. Yes, they do. Uh, um, the one thing with the having them in a pot, um, be careful you don't overwater them. Peonies like it dry, um, not deserty dry, but they don't like to be wet. Um, so evenly moist is good. Um, make sure you fertilize your pots as well because there's no uh, fertilizer in the potting soil that we sell. Um, so make sure you do that when you fertilize or when you plant them. So mine are out in the sun all day, um, and he does just fine. Um, I've heard that some of them like the, the etox, the, the tree peonies. They tend to like a little bit of shade in the, the, the afternoon. Um, but I've seen them where as long as they get six hours, whether it's in the morning or in the afternoon, they bloom like crazy. Um, peonies are one of those that actually just look like a shrub after they finish blooming and they'll stay green until we get cold and then they die um, or they die back. Um, and then you just cut them back and they come back up the next year. Um, if you have peonies in the ground, fertilization is important. Right now we want to give them that food so they can blossom. Uh, so the, the all-purpose fertilizer and a little bone meal will help boost that flowering process as well. Now's the time if you have a shady spot. Um, the Mediterranean heaths are great. Um, these are just great little shrubs that are going to kind of be about two by two, three by three. Um, beautiful spring blossoms. Uh, they come in pink and white. Um, the bees love them, so be very careful. Don't put this right in front of your front door or right next to your patio where you have coffee all the time um, because the bees go crazy about this guy. Um, once spring is over, it's just going to be a nice little evergreen shrub, um, really fine, almost pine-like needles um, on him. So great shade-loving shrub. Stock. Um, stock is one of those that I love. It's a um, annual that we get from 
uh, fall through May. Um, it can handle the cold and smells glorious. It smells like uh, cloves. Um, so if you get a chance, stop by and smell the stock. Forsythia, um, this is the show off. Um, show off is obviously blooming right now. Um, all your forsythias are gonna start, these are a little bit early because they did come in from Oregon, so they're a little ahead of us, but um, you should start seeing color in your spring blooming um, trees and shrubs soon. Um, my peach tree started blooming last weekend. Um, it's like, <sighs> um, but I did see some red buds popping uh, on my way home yesterday. So they are starting. Um, so to start, it's time to start enjoying the springtime and enjoying the colors that we have. Um, so uh, lilacs, forsythias, if you're interested in these, we get them in the spring and we don't get them. Once we run out, we're done. Um, because people don't like to buy plants that aren't blooming. So if you want one, now's the time to do it. Those shrubs that bloom in the summer, um, like your crepe myrtles, uh, Rosa Sharon's, butterfly bushes. Um, we actually have some sticks coming in next week um, just because of the open house. Um, and my vendors are bringing some new varieties for us, um, which we're really excited about. Um, but most of your crepe myrtles and your Rosa Sharon's won't show up until later in the springtime. Uh, those two are both very late bloom or, uh, beginners, so they don't even start leafing out until the end of April, early May. Um, so we don't see them um, until then. So what you're gonna see next week will be sticks. <laughs> Um, poppies. Now's a great time for poppies. Um, this one is called Champagne Bubbles. It's an Iceland poppy. Um, it is a zone seven plant. Um, I've had hit and miss uh, on this guy. Um, I don't ever get them to come back, but they do go to seed really, really easily. So they just, I have kind of a poppy garden that I keep going. Um, so um, I just kind of leave that area alone and try not to dig too much in there to disturb them. Um, but I have Calif or these, uh, the Icelands, I have the California poppies that aren't budded yet, but they should start soon. If you want to get them started in your yard, they're, they're over here. I have a contract grow on my California poppies too, that'll be coming in soon. Um, they're just so popular and they're gorgeous. This is a, one of my favorites. Um, this is a globe spruce, um, small shrub, about four by four. Um, so you kind of get that Colorado blue spruce look with only a small area. Um, he is uh, global, global. Um, so he'll stay nice and round. Um, so great little shrub. We also get these on a standard sometimes. So it's just like a giant lollipop. Uh, but a great little shrub with the blue spruce color. Mugo pines are one of our favorites around here. Um, this is just a dwarf mugo. Uh, again, about four by four, five by five. Um, they can get bigger in 30 years. If you do not do any pruning at all, he can be 15 feet tall and wide. Um, so most people will just start pruning once they get to the size they want. And to prune these, you just pick off the candles, which is their new growth. Um, and that keeps them from popping out any other way. Um, but a great little shrub, very, very drought tolerant. So once a week watering, once they're established is all they need. Um, if you overwater them, they tend to get yellow inside um, and then they'll die off on you. Autumn sage. Autumn sage is one of my favorite shrubs. Um, the hummingbirds just love this guy. Um, when we bring them in, they, they just fill the lower house. And I've got hummingbirds. You have to dart 
out of the way because you feel like you're going to get impaled. <laughs> um, but autumn sages come in a variety of different colors. Um, pinks and purples, uh, the, the, the hot lips, which is what this one is, is a red and white. Um, coral, white. Uh, so any color that you need in your garden, we have one to match it. Um, these all tend to get in that three by three size range. Hot lips I've seen get bigger. It just depends on how often you prune them back. Um, if you let them go and let, let them get big, they can get four or five feet. Um, but then they do tend to get woody. Um, so it just kind of depends on the look that you're after. Um, they do need to be pruned every year. Um, or like I said, if you want them big, then just leave them alone. Um, but this is one of my favorite plants. They're deer resistant. Um, so the deers, rabbits, I'll leave this alone. So if you have that problem, this is a perfect one for you. Say that again? Absolutely. Um, basically everything except the heath, everything up here likes the full sun. What did I miss? I told you about roses. I think I'm done. Um, for your shade loving plants, um, sulfur, uh, we need to add sulfur. Like I said earlier, pH is really crazy here. It's, it's up here. Most of your shade loving plants like it down here. So the extra sulfur, even with our fruit food, it's not enough to bring it down for those acid loving plants, um, like your heath, your, your uh, purists, your hydrangeas. You'll need to add a little extra sulfur for those um, just to keep them happy. So um, that's another product. Um, dormant oil, brought that up too. Here, uh, fruit trees. Um, if you haven't put it down, I did tell you guys to do it about now um, at the fruit tree class. Um, but this helps keep all that stuff that's laying dormant on the tree itself. So your fungal issues, your thrip, um, your aphids that are just kind of waiting to pop out, this will suffocate them. Um, so it keeps that from happening. Uh, this is also if you have apple trees, pear trees, and you have the worms in them, this is what you spray on them. Yes. Uh, so it is dormant, well, it's horticultural oil, but right now you're spraying it on the whole tree. Um, you're just coating the trunks, the limbs, underneath the limbs, because that's where they kind of hide and, and lay, um, because it's more protected from our elements. So if you were, egg, they're going to lay it under, on the bottom side of your branch. Horticultural oil. Um, it's also known as dormant oil, which is why I keep flip-flopping on it. Any other questions? Yes. 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 Um, so yes, milkweed works really well up here. It just depends on the variety. Um, so if you're looking for perennial varieties that come back every year, you're looking for the tuberosa, um, which is milkweed tuberosa is our, our perennial variety. The tropical uh, milkweed it is very bright in color and you get this huge plant that can actually feed the monarchs, um, and that is an annual, and I sell it up here as an annual. So here shortly, our, our houses will be transitioned, so everything that's up here will be annual um, plants. Everything down there will be perennial. So if you find it up here, it will not come back next year. If you find it down there, it should come back for you. Okay. Milkweed is very touchy, so we won't have it until May. Yeah. Any other questions I can answer for any of you? Okay. Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. Enjoy the day. Try to stay warm. <laughs>
Thank you so much. Hi. Okay. But not on. <laughs> okay. So 